Okay, we are on pages 148 and 149. Um, we're going to read 148, and what I want you guys to do is look at how this story is sequenced. Okay, so, um, or look how it's organized, I guess. So look at the different paragraphs and kind of see, okay, what's the first paragraph about? Um, and then what's the second paragraph about? And what's the third paragraph about? And kind of um, try to find a difference between those. Just see how this author organized this um, part of the story, okay? So the Badger Pass, I want you guys to read along with me, um, or follow along with me at least. So um, we're going to begin with Badger Pass. The first tourists arrived in 1855. They traveled on horseback. I wonder if they were as amazed as I am by the first glimpse of the scenic park. Today, more than 3.5 million people visit the park every year. Most come in the summer months. That's a lot of visitors and a lot of cars. But what's nice is that 94% of the park has been designated as wilderness. These areas can only be reached by foot or by horseback. After a four hour drive from San Francisco, we arrived at the Arch Rock Entrance Station. This is on the western side of the park, just north of Badger Pass. Badger is a popular ski spot. It opened in 1935 and was California's first ski area. Seven years later, the first ski school in the state was started in Yosemite Valley. That's where we'll begin exploring the park. Okay, so it, she kind of explains that we're gonna be talking about Yosemite Valley next, which look at that, our next, our next um, paper is Yosemite Valley. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Did you guys notice, though, how this, this one, Badger Pass, was organized? That first paragraph talks more about um, tourists in the past, so the 1855, those tourists coming into the region. She even says, I wonder if they saw the scenery and was as impressed as I was. Okay, I wonder if it looked the same. Okay, she has these thoughts kind of going through her mind. And then the second and even really the third paragraph kind of explains... Um, more of the tourists now. So why do you think the author organizes it in this way? Why do you think he or she goes from talking about the past, the tourists in the past, to now talking about the tourists in the present or the tourists now? Why do you think this author organized this text or why do you think she structures it this way? Okay, if she organizes the text this way, she's comparing um, how Yosemite changed, right? So the changes that were made from 1855 to now. Okay, it talks about in 1855 they traveled on horseback. And she says she wondered if the first glimpse of the scenic park was as, um, as neat or as impressive as it was now, because it's pretty impressive now. And then she also says now um, there are some places you can only get by foot or horseback. So Comparing there, they still use those horses to kind of travel through the area just like they did back then. But it also explains that um, they can drive too, so that four hour drive from San Francisco. So the driving too is a little bit different. So really just the comparison and comparing and contrasting of that, that whole um, passage helps us to kind of understand the changes that were made throughout the park. Okay, let's go on to 149, and this one's called Yosemite Valley. So Yosemite Valley is only seven miles long and one mile wide, but it's where the most services are. Our campground is here, and so are many of the park's best natural attractions. It's the most heavily visited part of the park. Today we learned about the Miwok and Paiute people and about the natural history of the park. Then we hopped on the shuttle bus to see famous sites like Yosemite Falls, El Capitan, and Happy Isles. One of my favorite places was Mirror Lake, where we saw Tanea Canyon reflecting in the water. Okay, so Mirror Lake, why do you think they call it Mirror Lake? So mirrors reflect, right? And they're saying that this whole big canyon reflects from the water. So if you would look in the water, you could see the canyon just reflecting. So she compares that or 
um, the name kind of compares it to a mirror, how a mirror reflects you, the water reflects the canyon. So she says how cool that is. Um, we are on Bridal View, a uh, creek or fall. It seems that wherever we look, there's something bigger, higher, or even more impressive than before. More than half of America's highest waterfalls are found in Yosemite. One of the prettiest is Bridal View, Bridal Veil Fall. It is located near the entrance to Yosemite Valley. The Anawachi, called Bridal View Fall, Pohono, which means spirit of the puffing wind. Sometimes hard winds actually blow the falls sideways. I'm glad I brought my raincoat because we got soaked by the spray on the way up. The waterfall is 620 feet high. That's as tall as a 62 story building. This author I feel like is very good at comparing things, right? She compares the size of things a lot to different states and even here she compared the size of that waterfall to a building, something that we might be more familiar with. So a 62 story building is, um, if your school is two stories, so there's an upstairs and a downstairs, that would be two stories. A 62 story building, that would be 62 stories high. So can you imagine how high that would be? Um, what do you think the author's opinion is of this Bridal Veil Creek or Fall? Just by hearing or reading what she says about it. Well, she starts her paragraph off saying, it seems that wherever we look, there's something bigger, higher, and more impressive than before. Okay, so she's pretty much saying there, she's introducing this Bridal View Creek very um, impressively, right? She's saying that it's big, high, I mean, it's just meeting or ex expanding her expectations. It's surpassing her expectations of what she's already seen. So she's saying how impressive, impressive it is. And then she also says it's one of the prettiest um, views. Um, so in that first paragraph, it says one of the prettiest is Bridal View Fall or Bridal Veil vale Fall. Um, so yeah, she has very, um, she speaks very highly of this bridal veil fall she is very impressed by it and we know that just by some of the things that she says in this in this piece of paper that is labeled bridal veil fall so we know that that's what she's talking about now why did i want you to go back in your text right under that bridal veil fall again why did this group of people those indians call um, bridal veil fall they called it pohono which means spirit of the puffing wind why did they call it that Go back in your book and look. It says, it says why they called it that. Okay, so it says sometimes hard winds actually blow the, the falls sideways. So these winds would be so hard, it would make these waterfalls. If you look on page 149, that's what a waterfall is, that Bridal Veil Fall. And it would blow all of that water, so it would be more at an angle. So it would kind of move it off track. Those winds were so hard that it could do that. That water was really gushing down and those winds were so powerful that they could they could blow that fall into a different direction okay so go ahead and go to the next pages or the next slide and we will read the next two page two pages